Sister Mary Gemma, it is a pleasure to have you uh, with us on this podcast, on this video. Uh, welcome. How are you today? Thank you. Very well. Thank you. Good, good. Well, to those who may not know who you are, actually, this is the first time that you and I have spoken. Um, yes. Could you tell tell me, tell us a little bit about who you are and, and what you do, Sister? All right. So um, my name is Sister Mary Gemma. I was born in Australia and I entered the religious life here in the United States. I have been a religious now for 33 years and am currently stationed in St. Mary's, Kansas. Wonderful. 33 years. That is, that's a long time. God bless you for your perseverance. That's, uh, that's outstanding. Well, we wanted to talk to you a little bit about the SSPX sisters. As you know, this, this series that we're doing is all about vocations. And so we wanted to talk to a few of the different religious orders, uh, to understand what a religious vocation is like. So I guess I'll ask you first, sister, if there are any certain characteristics or qualifications of a young lady that would make her a good, you know, air quotes, a good uh, <laughs> SSPX sister compared to another order, say Dominicans or Franciscans, what, what type of qualities or attributes are you looking for? Well, actually, let me start by explaining a little bit about our congregation. The sisters were founded by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre for the current crisis in the church. He wanted the spirit of the, our congregation to be the spirit of the church, to remain faithful to the church of all times. That being said, the characteristics looked for in a young lady that would make her a good society sister would be a great love for the church and for its treasures, the holy sacrifice of the mass and the priesthood. And in consequence of this current crisis in the church, an ability to give herself generously, to have a spirit of reparation, to be an ardent soul. As daughters of two missionaries, Archbishop Lefebvre and his blood sister, Mother Marie Gabrielle, a society sister is meant to have a missionary spirit, zeal for souls, ready for anything, even to go to the end of the world if God wants. To be called upon to be ready for anything is something rather unique to our congregation as our apostolic activity is so diverse, unlike other religious orders who have a more specific focus in their apostolate. The Archbishop wanted his congregation sufficiently broad in its scope of activity so as, so as to embrace every soul of goodwill, so that whatever the strengths of any young lady, she would find place in our congregation. Therefore, an aspirant, for example, to our congregation would not be seeking a particular apostolic work in itself, but rather to be animated by the desire to imbibe this missionary spirit. Now, at the same time as being missionary, our congregation is also semi-contemplative, made for young ladies who desire to unite a life of prayer to action. And so any young lady desiring a life of prayer and action, animated by the missionary spirit, would be welcome and encouraged to try our congregation. That's beautiful. So so what you're saying is the SSPX sisters, there's not really, you're not a teaching order. You're not a an order that helps the poor. It's, you could be called upon to do anything everything. and everything. And oftentimes you are. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Most certainly. What is, so let's look at the process then for, um, for joining the SSPX sisters. Um, how would one go about this process? What is, what is the discernment process for, for a young lady? Well, any young lady interested in our congregation or simply just wondering what religious life really is can come to visit one of our novitiates. During the visit, the young lady would have the opportunity to see the inside, if you like, of the sister's daily life. That is, our daily life lived. She would also have the opportunity to speak with the mistress of novices in order to help her discern whether or not she may have a religious vocation. That being said, be assured that a visit to the convent is not committing oneself to anything. 
It is not entrance into the religious life. Rather, this visit shows a great generosity on the part of the young lady, which uh, is rewarded by special graces and light in discerning the will of God for her, whatever that may be. So you're not going to kidnap anyone if they just come to visit, is what you're saying? <laughs> Certainly not. You know, okay. it's, right. it's, it's easier to leave a religious house than to enter one. <laughs> ah, okay. Fair enough. Um, so once a young lady decides that she wants to try the religious life, she wants to try uh, the SSPX sisters and has decided that she wants to give of herself, um, what does that next process look like? A lot of people know about the minor orders leading up to the priesthood. It takes five or six years. There's these certain steps, et cetera. Um, could you explain what the what the corollary is or what the same sort of thing is for the SSPX sisters? Like how does how does the novitiate postulate vows system work? What are, how long does it take? Yes. So before the formal training in the religious life, a young lady can spend a time of preparation called prepostulancy, which, so to speak, eases her into the religious life, as this transition is not at all automatic. There is such an abyss between the spirit of the world and a traditional religious life that it takes time. And this pre-postulancy is very beneficial for the young lady before making the decision to begin a postulancy or not. Depending on the individual soul, the pre-postulancy can last from one to two years. The next step in becoming a sister is a time of postulancy. The postulancy has a duration of six months. A postulant does not wear the religious habit, nor does she make vows. It's a time of preparation for the religious life and for the taking of habit. The postulant attends classes which reveal to her the beauty of the religious life, introducing her little by little into the spirit of our congregation. Given by our founder, Archbishop Lefebvre, and his sister, Mother Mary Gabrielle. Having completed her postulancy, if she so desires and with the permission of the Superior General, the postulant receives the religious habit and her religious name. The reception of this new name is the beginning of her new life. She is now a novice, an official member of our religious family. Now, during the two-year novitiate, the novice receives a profound spiritual and religious formation the study of the three vows of religion and their rule. They deepen the knowledge of their faith through the catechism classes. They are taught how to converse with our Lord through mental prayer. They are introduced into the splendors of the divine office, the prayer of the church. They attend classes on church history, sacred liturgy, holy scripture, and study the encyclicals of the popes, especially those who lived in the 19th century and in the first part of the 20th century who denounced modern errors. They add to these studies general knowledge of music, sewing, first aid, cooking, linen care, gardening, all that could be useful or necessary to them in their apostolate. In short, they are trained in body and soul to become true religious and true apostles. So after having completed her novitiate, the novice makes her religious profession pronouncing the public vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, consecrating her entirely to God. She receives the black veil, a crucifix, and a silver ring, signifying her espousal to our Lord Jesus Christ. She then prepares to receive her first nomination, ready to be sent anywhere, anywhere God calls her to devote herself to his priests and to the salvation of souls. So this process is very gradual. You don't you don't want yes. a, a young lady to come in and immediately join the religious congregation for her benefit and also I would assume for the benefit of the congregation itself. That's right. That's right. It is a, a, a great transition um, to go from the world into religious life and a lot depends also on the background of the young lady and how exposed she is already to tradition, um, to sure. Catholic life. So a young lady then, a, a sister now, has, has made, um, made her religious profession and she is sent to, to go work somewhere to be part of the apostolate. Um, at what point then 
are the final vows. She is not a religious sister. She's not an SSPX sister for life yet at this point. Is that correct? Well, actually, it's a very interesting question. From the moment the religious makes her profession, her first vows, her intention must be to belong to our Lord Jesus Christ, her spouse forever. In her heart, she is fixed upon our Lord and wishes, like Our Lady, to belong entirely to him. Just as when, for example, a young lady um, gets married, in her heart it is until death. How much more for a soul espoused to our Lord? That being said, our congregation allows the sisters the privilege of making perpetual vows after at least 10 years of religious profession. All right. It's very interesting. So, Sister, could we ask a little bit about some vocation stories, whether it's your vocation story or if you would like to talk about some of the other sisters, um, what kind of, because, uh, you know, I, I went to school at, at St. Mary's and I was taught by the sisters and we always kind of thought, well, they're not real people. They're just wearing the black veil and there's not a real person under there, is there? Um, so could you tell us a, a few stories of, of some of the sisters and what they did maybe before they entered the convent and what kind of people they are? Yes, certainly. So everyone loves a good story, and certainly every religious has a unique story of her own, uh, of how she heard and followed the call of our Lord. We have sisters who were professionals uh, in a career, nurses, doctors, bakers, chefs, florists, musicians, seamstresses, and who heard the call and responded. Others were in the midst of their higher education or or college. Some knew from childhood that they wanted to be a religious sister, and that was through contact with the sisters, um, either at school or during summer camps. Others had absolutely no inclination to, to, to the religious life and were even engaged to be married when our Lord stole their heart. Many of the sisters come from solid Catholic backgrounds, but some were converted to the faith and then embraced the higher calling. Others found tradition after being in the confusion of the Novus Ordo and longed to join the fight for the church in this current crisis. In any case, though the details of each vocation story are personal and particular, for all of us, it was the love of our Lord Jesus Christ which drew us to accept a religious vocation. And we chose this congregation because of our gratitude to Archbishop Lefebvre and our desire to unite ourselves to his fight for Christ the King. All that I can add is that all, without exception, superabound with joy. The joy of belonging to our Lord Jesus Christ, a joy which surpasses all the joys of this world and which is ever increasing. It's beautiful. I can, I can tell, tell you from experience, sister, I've never met uh, a sister of the SSPX who's not joyful, who doesn't have that joyful <laughs> spirit. It's, it's almost like it's a prerequisite. <laughs> if not, it's obtained very quickly once you enter religious life. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, sister, as, as we know, every every religious order has a particular charism, has a particular, and we've talked already previously about some of the things that the SSPX sisters do, but I'd like to get more into the heart of the spirituality of, of different orders. So what is at the heart of the SSPX's sisters' spirituality? Uh, what is it that, that really defines that interior life? All right, so every religious congregation, as we know, was raised up by God during a certain period of history in order to fulfill a particular role in the church and to take care of a pressing need. The priestly society, St. Pius X, and our congregation of sisters were founded by Archbishop Lefebvre as the remedy for the current crisis in the church. Our spirituality is very simply the spirituality of the Church and of Our Lady and of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, as the Archbishop himself explained. Everything is found therein, since the sacrifice of our Lord and the Mass are but one. The Mass is the treasure of himself that our Lord has left to us. 
The sisters are under a double patronage, that of St. Pius X and Our Lady of Compassion. Our principal patron is Our Lady of Compassion, that is, Our Lady, standing at the foot of the cross, uniting herself with the sacrifice of her son. The sisters' whole spirituality is to unite themselves to Our Lord's sacrifice with Our Lady. So if you would summarize our spirituality, it is that of the cross, the sacrifice of the Mass. It is our Lord asking us to unite ourselves to his sacrifice in imitation of Our Lady. Another point that makes our congregation unique is our rule. Archbishop Lefebvre was a religious himself. He knew by experience the religious life, the life of the vows. As Bishop of Dakar, and then as Apostolic Delegate, he had the opportunity to invite numerous religious congregations to Africa. Later, when the Archbishop was writing our constitutions, he had before him the constitutions of several different religious congregations that he knew firsthand, and he drew the best out of them to write our rule. Indeed, we have inherited a tremendous treasure in our rule. We have a way of life which unites contemplation and action. It is what St. Thomas Aquinas calls the mixed life, which contemplates and then transmits to souls the fruit of that contemplation through apostolic works. Our rule contains a daily hour of adoration before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Very interestingly, the Archbishop explained to us that one congregation stood out while he was a missionary in Africa, the Franciscan Missionary Sisters of Mary. This congregation expanded with remarkable rapidity. Having seen them at work in the missions, the Archbishop saw that they had something very special about them. The sisters had an hour of adoration each day before the Blessed Sacrament. The Archbishop said that this adoration was the secret for their great number of vocations and the extraordinary work which they accomplished in the missions. This then was the reason why the Archbishop included an hour of Eucharistic adoration in our rule. During this adoration, we are encouraged to remain close to our Lord, uniting ourselves to Our Lady of Compassion, making reparation for all the sins and outrages committed against our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. We pray for the Pope, for the bishops, for all priests, for all consecrated souls, and for all souls. We unite ourselves with Our Lady in her compassion through the willing offering of ourselves and our religious life. The Archbishop told us that he entrusted the sanctification of the priestly society to the prayers of the sisters. Truly, our primordial purpose is to pray and sacrifice for priests. All our life is therefore centred on the Mass and the priesthood. That is what the Archbishop wanted. I would say it must be a huge consolation for the priests, not just priests of the society, but all priests, to to know that they have behind them, lifting them up spiritually, the sisters of the Society of St. Pius X, helping them spiritually, giving them that, that support because they are so attacked, especially nowadays. Yes, certainly. And we also, we realize what pressures they are under, you know, in this modern world and the battle they have to fight. And so our our great joy is to be there before our Lord, um, you know, pleading on their behalf, the graces they need in their apostolate, in their ministry to help souls, to save souls. No, that's a, it's a huge consolation. So l- let's look at the SSPX sisters as a whole. Um, for the SSPX sisters, uh, it is it is an interesting story because it didn't exist before, say, what, 1970, 1970, something like that? That's correct. So to explain, um, permit me to review the origin of the Priestly Society. 
Having the same father and founder, the beginnings of the priestly society are also, in fact, the beginnings of the sister society. In 1970, Bishop Charrier officially approved the statutes of the priestly society St. Pius X, which were written by the Archbishop. The priest's statutes contain an explicit reference to a future affiliated congregation of sisters who would assist the priest in their ministry. The sister society was as much part of Archbishop Lefebvre's vision for the restoration and sanctification of the priesthood as the priestly society. But when would God choose to raise these sisters up? A very interesting story. In 1973, during a visit to Australia, Archbishop Lefebvre met a young lady named Janine Ward who wished to enter the religious life. The Archbishop encouraged her generous desire. However, the Archbishop knew little English and Janine did not know any French. So after their conversation, Janine had made up her mind to enter what she had understood was the already established Society Sisters. When in fact, the Society Sisters did not yet exist except in the mind of the Archbishop. (laughs) Seeing the hand of Divine Providence, Archbishop Lefebvre set to work founding the Society Sisters with the help of his blood sister, Mother Marie Gabriel, a Holy Ghost sister. So Mother Mary Gabriel, responding to the call of her brother, very generously came to transmit the religious life to our first sisters, and became the first superior general of our congregation. Janine became the first postulant and was followed by several others. So she, so she had no idea that she was going to be the uh, the litmus test for all of the society sisters throughout the world. <laughs> That's right. Oh, no. That's how God's providence works. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful, though. Yes. Um, so fast forwarding a bit to today. Uh, how many houses, how many religious houses are there around the world for the SSPX sisters? All right. So our congregation had the great joy of opening its 30th house last year on the Feast of the Assumption in the Society Seminary in Icon. Our convents are located on five continents. We have houses in Europe, North and South America, Australia and Africa. Two of our convents are in mission territories one in Gabon, Africa, where the Archbishop himself worked and toiled, the other in the Dominican Republic. We currently have 216 sisters, of which 17 are novices. Our sisters have come from 21 different countries all over the world, well illustrating the Catholicity of the Church. This year, we have the grace to receive 14 postulants and 17 prepostulants. That's beautiful. It's it's a universal congregation from all over. <laughs> yes. Missionary. <Wow. laughs> yes. Um, so can people uh, visit visit you if they're interested? Would you recommend they visit, uh, say, the, the convent in St. Mary's or somewhere else? Or All right. Certainly. So, of course, any young lady is, um, is welcome to visit. Um, if they're interested in the congregation, um, they can visit one of our four novitiates, so we have a French-speaking novitiate in Rufec, France, a German-speaking novitiate in Goffingen, Germany, a Spanish-speaking novitiate in uh, Pilar, Argentina, and, of course, an English-speaking novitiate in Browville, Minnesota, here in the United States. And then if, if they would like to set up something like this, or even if they just want to get some more information after seeing, seeing uh, this episode, Sister, um, who can people contact? For a young lady interested in setting up a visit, she can find contact information on the Society's website. In contacting the convent, she would ask to speak to the novice mistress. Our car- current novice mistress for our English-speaking novitiate in Browville is Sister Marie Gerard. Of course, any young lady can always ask any society sister for the needed information. We are always happy to render service. Wonderful. So what does a typical day, and there 
probably is no typical day. <laughs> uh, but what does what does a typical day for a sister of the Society of Saint Pius X look like? Our day begins close to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, with the office of prime, followed by mental prayer and holy mass. After breakfast, the sisters go to their various tasks. The activities of the sisters are varied according to the needs of the priory. Many sisters teach in our society schools, and a good number instruct adult converts in the truths of the faith. Others devote themselves to visiting the sick and the elderly, and those assigned to the society's nursing homes watch by the bedside of the dying. All share in more hidden tasks, such as work in the sacristy, linen care, vestment making, alban surplus making, ironing, and starching of the altar cloths, for example, cooking, gardening, arranging bouquets, book binding, lace making, embroidery, sewing, office work. Some sisters lead chapters of the Eucharistic Crusade or the Marian associations, like the Children of Mary. During the summer, Various sisters direct camps for hundreds of young ladies on the five continents where the sisters reside. We have sisters who devote themselves in retreat houses, while our sisters in Albano, Italy, care for the many visitors who pass through on pilgrimage to Rome. A large apostolate of our novitiates and mother house also includes a catechism by correspondence program reaching over a thousand children and adults worldwide. Really, the list can go on and on. We are trained to adapt to all circumstances, to be ready to serve in any capacity in order to collaborate with our priests in their apostolate. Everything for the love of God and for the salvation of souls. Coming back to the schedule, at midday, the sisters unite again in the chapel for the first half hour of adoration before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, followed by the office of sext with our priest's community. The sisters then have lunch and a time of recreation in community. The sisters form a true family. We could summarize, if you like, our spirit as a joyful, broad-minded family spirit united in the same life, completely offered to God in simplicity, generosity, and devotedness. After some free time, the sisters return to their various tasks before reuniting in the evening for spiritual reading, a second half hour of adoration, and the rosary prayed in common with our priests. After our evening meal, we again have a time of recreation together before finishing our day with the Office of Compline. Very busy. I'm sure there's never a boring <laughs> never a moment, dull moment. In, in, in any of the convents. <laughs> never. Uh, it's beautiful, never. though. Well, Sister, Sister Mary Gemma, I appreciate so much you taking the time to, to speak with us. And also, thank you so much for the work that you are doing for, for the priests and for, for all of us. That's very kind. And I, I would just hope that this podcast um, will enlighten many on the beauty of the religious life. Certainly, our Lord is calling souls to the religious life. The harvest is great, and as we know, indeed, the labour is too few. So let us pray that God send us many holy religious vocations. Thank you. Indeed. Sister, thank you. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of the SSPX Podcast. You can find all our previous series and episodes on sspxpodcast.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to and rate this podcast on whatever podcast app you use and on YouTube. This helps more people to discover the beauty and the truth of traditional Catholicism. And if you're able, we'd greatly appreciate your support of a one-time or a monthly recurring donation for these projects. All that information is at sspxpodcast.com. Until next time, thank you for listening and God bless you.